Please welcome Colin Wright. Thank you. Oh, good. I can hear myself. Um, so extremes. Extremes are easy. Balance is hard. And for most of my life, I've been a pretty extreme person. I think a lot of us are. Definitely extreme as a teenager. I started my first business when I was 19. And when I graduated, that experience provided me with a lot of opportunities. And those opportunities took me out to LA. And I pretty soon after that started my second business. And that second business did really, really well. I learned from that first experience. And I was able to make a whole lot of money, uh, a whole lot more money than I thought I'd be making at that point in my life, at least. And so I did what a lot of people do when they're making money and they never made money before, like never made real money, I adopted that very specific facet of the American dream, the work hard, play hard lifestyle, which in my case meant I would work for like 100 hours a week, 120 hours a week in some cases, and then with whatever bare scraps of time I could scrounge together at the end of the week, I'd go out and spend all that money to make it seem worthwhile, right? And I'd buy all the gadgets and all the clothes and, and all the accoutrement of success to show that I was doing well. And during this time period, I met a girl who was living a very similar lifestyle. She was an entrepreneur as well, also very driven, working hard, playing hard. And I met her when we were out doing this thing in LA. It's called networking. And what that really means is you go out and drink and hope that you meet somebody who ends up being a client. She was out doing the same thing, and we met, and we dated, and we networked together. And then eventually we moved in, we got a nice townhouse on the west side, and worked hard and play hard, or played hard for the next couple of years. At a certain point, though, we realized that something wasn't quite right, because we were living together, but we never saw each other. We were just working these crazy hours and exhausted all the time that we could scrounge together to spend with each other. And it just, something was off. And we had a discussion about this and realized that, that something had to change because both of us had these dreams that we weren't pursuing, dreams that we had decided we'd do at some point. We'd put it off for some day. Today, we were just maintaining this particular lifestyle because we wanted to maintain the relationship we wanted to maintain the networking events and all the things that went with that. And being the problem solvers that we were, we looked at this and said, no, this can't stand. We need to do something about it. And we had a lot of discussions and thought about it and decided that four months from that day, we would have a breakup party. And we would invite all our friends over and celebrate a wonderful relationship that really served its purpose and helped us grow and gave us an enjoyable couple of years. And then we'd go off in our separate directions and pursue these dreams that we had been putting off. And for me, that meant travel. Now, this was something that I always told myself I would do. I would travel the world and see what was out there and look for new perspectives, meet new people, try new foods, listen to new music. And I never had the opportunity, because I, I never really had a lot of money when I was a kid. And then when I started to make money, I always had more important things to do, these businesses that I was running. And I was 24, and my dream was to travel, and I had never left the country. I had a blank passport. So it was time to make up for lost time. And so I did what most people do when they're confused and in their 20s. I started a blog. <laughs> And I called it Exile Lifestyle. And I started to write about the things that I already knew about, things like entrepreneurship and branding and the things I wanted to learn about, like full-time travel and simplicity. And I ended up getting rid of everything that I owned that didn't fit into a carry-on bag. And that was a full-time job all unto itself. But it was helpful to people, and they were helpful to me in return. And as a result, I was able to accumulate the knowledge and the information and connections that I needed and after the breakup party, I took off. I didn't know where to go. I had my readers vote on where I should move because I figured everyone in the world had a better idea of which places were cool than me. Um, and they sent me to Argentina, and I had a wonderful time, and so wonderful that four months later, I had them vote again, and then again, and again. And now six years later, I've been traveling full time for six years, moving to a new country every four months or so based on the votes of my readers. It was less than a year later that I encountered a second extreme, because the lifestyle that I was living in LA was definitely an extreme. It was work over life. 
And I wanted to see what the other side looked like. I wanted to see what the other end of that spectrum was so that I might be better able to find my correct balance point in between, a pivot point, an equilibrium. And that next extreme that I faced took place while I was living in New Zealand, which is an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, if anybody here has been there, you can back me up on this. One of the most naturally beautiful places in the world. I often tell people that you could set the timer on your camera and just throw it in the air, and whatever photograph it takes will be the best photo you take in your entire life. <laughs> it's remarkable. It's just gorgeous, almost unfairly gorgeous. And while I was living there, I climbed a mountain. That is to say, I hiked a path up a mountain, and it took me the better part of a day. And I got up to the top, and I sat down on a rock, and I looked out at the horizon. And there was kind of these roiling clouds and fog and little like road cone-like treetops poking out from the clouds, other mountains off in the distance. And I could smell the salt in the wind. I could taste the salt in the wind and feel it stinging against my face, and I could hear it whistling through the shrubs. And I remember so many specifics about that moment, about that day, but that moment in particular, because for the first time in my life, I was alone, truly, truly alone, in the sense that I was there alone on this mountaintop, but I was also coming to the end of a six-month experiment where I got rid of my phone and the mobile internet completely. I am not a Luddite. I, I'm not anti-technology. I love technology. I, I think it's remarkable that a device that fits in my pocket, I can take it out and communicate with anyone in the world at a moment's notice, instantaneously, across national borders, cultural borders, economic borders. I can reach into the cloud and access the archive of all of human knowledge and add to it. That's amazing. We're living in the future. That is so cool to me. But I love it so much that I spend a lot of my time there. I'm engaged in this wider network to the exclusion sometimes of what's going on right here. And this was an extreme that I knew I was missing out on something, running up against this far side of the spectrum. I knew there was something over here, but I had no idea what it was. I had never experienced that in my adult life, that disconnect from that larger human race. And so I wanted to see what it was like. And it came to a head on that mountaintop. And I realized that there were things that I was missing out on. And that equilibrium somewhere in between would have to be struck, or I'd be missing out on half of human experience. I don't think I'm the only one that feels this way. The digital sabbaticals have become a very big thing recently. Various life hacks that allow you to check your email less or get less email, check your social media less or get fewer messages on Facebook. But it's valuable, it's truly valuable. I was looking out at that horizon and I wasn't thinking of what filter to apply to it. I wasn't tasting the wind and trying to figure out how best to describe it in 140 characters or less. I was taking it in through the lenses of my eyes and it was remarkable and something valuable to me. And even though I ended up getting a phone later, I used it far more intentionally as a result. As a result of experiencing both extremes, I was more capable of finding where I should be on that spectrum in between, where my balance was. Now, individuals are not the only people who deal with this. Societies do as well. Another place that I've been fortunate to live is Iceland, really gorgeous place. And they have what you might call a good problem. And they have a lot of good problems, I would say, maybe just good things. But their good problem in this case is that they have a beautiful landscape. They've got beautiful natural resources, a wonderful culture, great music, great art. And about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit less, they started to really package this and sell it to the world. And before that, if you arrived in Iceland, it was by accident. But they took Brand Iceland and promoted it to the world. They told their story and people really liked that. And now it's an aspirational place that people go and add to their bucket list and they post Pinterest photos, someday I'll go here. It's, it's that type of place and deservedly so. But as a result of the success of their tourism industry, they've got more and, oh, there we go. They've got more and more of this happening. People going there and taking photos and the entire society reorienting itself around tourism. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with being able to share the resources that you have and having people coming and enjoying what you have to offer. But it does have dramatic changes for the residents of these types of places. 
Now, Reykjavik is the capital of Iceland. And Iceland as a whole country only has a few, a little bit over 300,000 people in total, about 320,000 people. It's a very small country population-wise. And 180,000 of them live in this one city. So over half of all Icelanders live in Reykjavik. And downtown Reykjavik is very small, it's very dense, there's always a lot going on, it's very walkable and pleasant. But as a result of all of this tourism, things are changing quite a bit. There was a time that you could find anything you needed in downtown Reykjavik without too much trouble. But now simple things are very, very hard to come by. All of the buildings are being replaced by hotels and hostels and restaurants that are aimed at spendy tourists rather than locals or students. And there was a time when you could walk outside of your house and find a hardware store and get a light bulb to replace the one that's gone out. But these days, you have to go way far out to the outskirts of town, to the big box stores, which might not be possible if you don't have a car because you're living downtown. But you can walk out your door, and you have five different options within walking distance that will sell you a giant stuffed puffin or a plastic Viking helmet. Dramatic change. And it's on its way toward an extreme, I would say. On one side, you have a place that used to be a vibrant, thriving country that has now become a, an Iceland-themed theme park, more or less. They're not there yet, but that's the direction that it's heading. And on the other side, you have a country that doesn't allow anybody in. You don't want any tourists, and you lose that side of the economy. You become less robust, fewer income streams, but you're also less capable of sharing your culture with the world. Neither extreme is desirable, but finding that middle point, that balance point, that equilibrium is incredibly difficult and requires a lot of attention and intention. I want to share one more story with you here. Another place that I've been fortunate to live is Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta in India. Very different place from Iceland or New Zealand. Calcutta is a city, first of all, not a country, but it's a city of over 14 million people. It's vast, much bigger than both New Zealand and Iceland combined. It's also very old. New Zealand and Iceland are new economies, new cultures, relatively speaking. This place has been inhabited for thousands of years by many different cultures. Their traditions, their roots run very deep. And as a result, it's been difficult for them to watch other cities in the western side of India grow with globalization and the global economy, because they've all benefited and slowly, iteratively adopted these new technologies and systems. Whereas Calcutta is often referred to as the city left behind. They haven't benefited quite as quickly or quite so much until just recently. And now these technologies are arriving, and you walk down these, uh, these roads into these neighborhoods where street kids who five years ago never would have been exposed to any ideas or people outside of their neighborhood in their entire lives, their parents weren't in a lot of cases, now have smartphones that are crazy cheap, and they're able to tap into that network I talked about before and be exposed to new ideas and new people and contribute in return. Can you imagine what that's gonna look like, what Calcutta will look like in 10 years as a result? of this exchange. But it's not all good, this integration of new technology, especially so quickly. This is an economy that's very traditional. They've got traditional methods of production, lots of handmade things, mostly local resources. If you walk around town even today, uh, in the early afternoon, you'll probably be handed at some point a cuppa, which is like milky sweetened tea. That's tradition to, to, do, uh, to take in as a community. And you sip it and drink it, and then you smash the ceramic cup on the ground. It's made of the local clay and local mud, so when it rains, it returns to the soil. It's, it's a system that's worked really well for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Today, though, they have new materials. Now they've been introduced to styrofoams and plastics and coated papers and inks and dyes and chemicals. And so when you walk around, you see the results of this. It's a society that's accustomed to just throwing the things on the ground because everything they used up until recently was biodegradable, was local. And now they have a major problem. You walk around and see their creeks and rivers are being dammed by all of the trash that they're discarding. Their sidewalks, their streets are just covered in trash everywhere you go. You can see the infrastructure that was there, but it's swiftly being buried by this new technology and materials that are coming and are going to stay. Their habits haven't adjusted yet. Their traditions haven't adjusted yet. And we can't expect them to necessarily. 
Even the animals, which have been such an integral part of the society for so long, the sacred cows, the dogs who would wander around and eat the leftover food scraps, now they're sharing the same trash pile, scrounging through the same fast food wrappers, looking for leftovers. Fast food wrappers that will never biodegrade, by the way, because they're coated. Extremes are the default that we move toward. Extremes are the goal at the horizon. And extremes are very sexy. Extremes sell books. You don't hear about a lot of very moderate, modulated diet plans. <laughs> you don't hear about a lot of very sensible workout routines. Those are not the things that sell memberships or books or ideas. Extremes are sexy. Extremes are what people want to hear about. But balance is a lot less volatile. Balance is what allows you to benefit from both ends of the spectrum. And balance is possible. It just requires a whole lot of attention and intention. <laughs> and the first start, as I've described so far, is that you need to identify the extremes, the extreme ends of the spectrum. If you can identify the extremes, then you're better able to find the shades of gray in between that black and that white. And you're probably not going to want either extreme. And you may be right in the middle. Chances are you'll be further to one end or the other. But starting with that spectrum, identifying what spectrum you're even walking on, is the first step to figuring out where you need to be, what's the optimal placement, the optimal balance for you. And from there, you need to determine your ideals. What do you want to see in the world? Who do you want to be, but what do you want your society to be? That will help you determine that pivot point, determine which, uh, which benefits you want to take from each extreme, and then which downsides you want to Can you still hear me? I'll shout a little. Oh, OK, we're good. <laughs> that helps you uh, individually move towards better balance, but also societally move towards better balance as well. There's a handheld player. Okay. I'm anyway, so. Hello, hello, cool. So then you need to identify your impact, which on a personal level is very easy. You are the master of your own fortune. But societally, it's a little bit more complicated. You need to figure out what type of oomph, what type of torque you have available. And in some cases, it could be as simple as voting or swaying tastemakers, becoming a tastemaker yourself, influencing people in that way, starting a blog, starting a podcast. You could write for the newspaper. You could start a business and influence things economically. You could influence things by having the right product, the right services available that will push things slightly this way or slightly that way and move it towards a better balance that you can see and that you want others to see. You can get involved with politics directly or indirectly. Whatever it takes, figure out what oomph you have behind your words and actions and then utilize it. Move closer to that point of balance that you want to see in the world. Extremes are easy. Balance is difficult. It's a whole lot harder. That's why people don't do it. But regardless, balance is a whole lot more sustainable, a lot less volatile, and gives you the benefits of both extremes. Balance is difficult, but it is very much worth the effort, no matter how many mountains we have to climb in order to achieve it. Thank you very much.